on Business Incorporated today. The United Nations Conference on Trade and Development says global tourism crash may cause $5.3 trillion loss to world economy. Sudan gets IMF approval for debt relief and a $2.5 billion funding. Plus, as OPEC Plus prepares to meet tomorrow, July 1, we will be looking at some of the expectations with the Chairman International Energy Services, Dr. Diro Fawibe. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Chimeze Obi Iwago. First, the market. Out here in Africa, markets were mixed at intraday. While the market here in Nigeria was up 0.12%, the JSE index in South Africa was in the red, 0.44%. The EGX30 in Egypt also traded in the green up 1.27%. KR was up 0.15% on Tuesday. And in the Middle East, it was more of red arrows. The markets in the UAE went sideways at intraday, while Abu Dhabi was up 1.07%. The Dubai financial market was down 0.61%. Elsewhere, Saudi Arabia was down 0.27%, and Qatar was down 0.17%. And European stocks pulled back in early trade as pandemic and inflation concerns lingered, but were still on course for a strong first half of the year. For more on market developments, here is Ashutosh Pandey. Hello, Ashutosh. Good afternoon. Well, Ashutosh, Chinese ride-hailing company DD Global raised $4.4 billion in its U.S. IPO, reaching a market valuation of nearly $70 billion. Investors seem to be uh, back in DD despite its regulatory troubles back home. Why is that? Well, clearly investors are looking to grab a pie of this huge Chinese uh, ride-hailing market uh, where DD is a dominant player. And, and that's exactly why they are uh, so bullish about this uh, uh, company and we've got to also see that uh, it's now profitable a uh, ride hailing company which is profitable is a rare site we all know it's very difficult to make a uh, profit in this business so that's again uh, their motivation and the fact uh, that it has uh, some really big uh, EV ambitions, uh, electric vehicle ambitions, that is also boding well for investors. Uh, but we all, we've got to also see that this is a case of like the valuation exceeding muted expectations. Uh, I remember just a few months, a uh, few weeks back, uh, uh, DD was actually uh, touted to command a market uh, capital uh, capitalization of around $100 billion, and now it's just $70 billion. So clearly uh, uh, the fact that it is under regulatory scrutiny, there are antitrust issues, uh, the fact that its uh, profit margins are actually tight, very low, and, and also the growth is slowing down, and it is just dependent on Chinese market uh, for now. So all that is weighing uh, on uh, the sentiments and that's the reason why they did uh, uh, bring down the IPO price and uh, the uh, expectations were pared down and the, but the low IPO price meant that uh, it, the deal became all the more actually attractive for potential investors. But then did his market debut is taking place I mean the general IPO fever what's going on? Well, yes, uh, there is a boom uh, around the world when it comes to IPOs, and, and that's thanks to uh, the central banks and governments keeping the money taps on. That has actually led to the rise of individual investors, retail investors, who are flush with cash and who are looking to buy into their favorite companies. And the companies are only more than happy to oblige them. And the dash to the market can also be explained from the fact that uh, for many months, uh, many of these companies had to stall their plans uh, because of the pandemic. And now, as the economy recovers, uh, they are actually uh, making their public debuts uh, into the public markets. So that's, again, uh, another reason that explains this boom. Uh, more than three, $50 billion have been raised uh, in IPOs in the first six months of this year, and that's a record. Uh, and by the way, the previous record was in the last six months of 2020. And Eurozone inflation reading for June was released earlier today. Any surprises there? 
Uh, well, uh, the, uh, the inflation uh, rate did go down a bit. 1.9% uh, was the headline figure, and uh, the core figure was also, it also marginally dipped, 0.9%. Uh, but like experts don't really see this as a long-term trend. They just see it as, as a, a blip, uh, a minor blip. And, and the, the reason why they say that is because uh, uh, there are so many factors that are going to actually keep pushing prices up, uh, the supply chain issues, higher commodity prices, there's pent-up demand. All this is actually going to drive prices higher from now. And, uh, and there are also some uh, technical issues uh, in the way things are measured, base effects uh, in particular. That's because in Germany, uh, uh, there was a reduction in VAT uh, last year, and that is also going to play in uh, those prices. Uh, so yes, all these factors are going to play on the... Uh, and this is only going to, inflation number is only going to go up uh, this year, later this year. To eventually come down sometime in a year, year's time, uh, that's what the experts say. And that's the reason why the ECB is not going to be too perturbed about this. And it is actually going to look through this data for now. Mm. All right. Thank you very much, Chair Ashutosh. Enjoy mm. the rest of the day. Thank you. And in the UK, an updated GDP data came in showing the economy shrank more than thought in the first quarter. Let's hear more from Juliana. Hello, Juliana. Good afternoon. Well, UK GDP shrank by 1.6% in January to March compared with a previous estimate of a 1.5% contraction according to updated data. It means uh, the UK economy was 8.8% lower than its pre-pandemic level. What more does the data reveal? Yeah, good afternoon, Chimazay. Uh, it basically reveals that the UK economy um, struggled in the first three months of the year, uh, worse than had um, previously been thought. As you said, uh, the revision from the Office for National Statistics that came out this morning reveals that uh, Q1 GDP fell by 1.6%. This obviously follows the 9.9% contraction last year, which is the worst fall in GDP in three uh, centuries. Um, how was the reaction? Not great. Um, the foot see um, definitely reacted uh, to this figure, but everybody is putting their hopes on Q2. We had uh, GDP figures for the month of April showing uh, that uh, GDP grew by 1.5%. Next week, Friday, we're going to have GDP figures for May, and lots of economists are pegging that at about 3.5%. So we're way in target of getting out of the trench uh, that we were in. But the Bank of England and, of course, the Treasury will be hoping that consumers start spending. According uh, to the data released by the ONS today, it showed that savings were up 19.9%, which is the highest on record. And I believe the British public are sitting on about £9.9 .9 billion of cash that they don't want to spend. It's this sort of cash uh, that will need to be spent if uh, GDP this year will be um, upwards of 7%, which is what the Bank of England are hoping it will be. All right, talking about market reactions there. In early trade, the FTSE 100 index fell to its lowest level in over a week, pulled down by miners and travel firms. What are the intraday market numbers saying and who are the drivers? Pretty much the same, still very much in the red at intraday. The FTSE 100 is down 0.69% and the FTSE 250 is down by 0.52%. In the currencies market, the British pound is up on the US dollar by 0.21%, up on the euro by 0.31% and up on the Japanese yen by 0.18%. I don't know if you're a fan of football, Chimazay, uh, <laughs> but if you are living in England, you can't get away with it. Football's coming home has been trending yesterday. It's still trending today. And because of England's spectacular win against Germany uh, by two goals to nil yesterday. Um, it's actually the bookies uh, that are pushing down the FTSE 100 today um, because I'm not a gambling person, but if you're the odds-on favourite to win and you win, I don't think the bookies really like that. Well, the investors are running scared anyway. So Entain, who's the owner of Ladbrokes and Coral, their shares are down by about 1.9%. Flutter Entertainment, owners of Power, uh, Paddy Power and Betfair, their shares are also trading down about 1.5% as well. Well, I'm not a fan of football, incidentally. Anyway, new legislation set to replace EU rules will grant the government and councils greater freedom to support businesses. Can you tell us more about this? 
Yeah, this is the subsidy control bill, which has just been signed through um, the House of Commons. Um, Prime Minister questions is just uh, finished wrapping up. And really, this is um, a final kind of goodbye uh, from EU uh, controls. It will now, this new bill will now allow the British government uh, to assist in helping private firms if they fall into trouble. And of course, this is pretty timely because so many small businesses have struggled during the pandemic and many of them have had to cut through a very thick red tape and layers of bureaucracy to get um, state aid. Now, historically, Britain has been known as not being too accommodating to uh, private enterprise within the country, not as much as their counterparts in France and Germany. That's all going to change, according to the business secretary, Kwasi Kwarteng, which is why this new bill has raised eyebrows amongst uh, some EU state members who are concerned about uh, competition laws, because, of course, we're competing against each other at the moment. But um, it has been uh, made very, very clear that even if um, the British government are able to subsidise some businesses, they will have to uh, stick very, very carefully to the rules of the World Trade Organization. All right, Juliana, we'll talk more tomorrow. In the meantime, enjoy the rest of the day. You too, thank you. And major Asian markets were mixed by the close on Wednesday with oil prices continuing to rise. Meanwhile, China released its data on manufacturing activity in the morning. Mainland Chinese stocks rose by the afternoon. The Shanghai Composite was up 0.50%, while the Shenzhen Component jumped 1.08%. Hong Kong's Hanseng Index was subdued, edging down 0.41% in the afternoon. China-based drug maker Hutchmate made its debut in Hong Kong. Japan's Nikkei 225 closed just below the flat line, and the topics edged down 0.3%. South Korea's Kospi was up 0.3%. Over in Australia, the S&P SS200 was up 0.16%. And U.S. stock futures were slightly lower in the morning as the market gets set to close out a winning first half of 2021 and second quarter. Futures on the Dow Jones Industrial Average implied an opening loss of about 50 points. Futures on the S&P 500 shed 0.1%, while NASDAQ 100 features loss less than 0.1%. While weekly mortgage applications and pending home sales data are due to be published today, payroll firms ADP is scheduled to report on the number of private payrolls added in June. Stocks likely won't see big movement until Friday's jobs report gives a better idea of the state of the economy. Economies expect 683,000 jobs were added in June. And away from the markets to all the news here, the slump in tourism caused by COVID-19 will cost the global economy more than, 50, more than $54 trillion for 2020 and 2021, much worse than anticipated as an uneven vaccination rollout crashes of development, developing countries that are highly dependent on international visitors. This is according to the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. UNCTAD says the losses this year alone could amount to 1.7 trillion US dollars and to 2.4 trillion US dollars, even as international tourism rebounds in the second half in countries like the US, Britain and France, which have higher vaccination rates. The study highlights the costly impact from an unequal access to vaccines around the world. Developing countries may account for as much as 60% of the estimated losses to global gross domestic products. And Sudan has received approval from the International Monetary Fund for relief on more than $56 billion in debt and new IMF funding of $2.5 billion over three years. The U.S. Treasury said on Tuesday it welcomed Sudan's clearance of about $1.4 billion in arrears to the International Monetary Fund, paving the way for the first phase of debt relief under the heavily indebted Poor Countries Initiative. The IMF has accepted the East African country into the highly indebted Poor Countries Initiative based on the country's commitment to macroeconomic reforms. And after the break, we'll look at uh, the expectations from the OPEC Plus meeting. Just stay with us. 
into global oil market. Now, prices extended the previous day's small gains today after an industry report showed U.S. crude stockpiles fell last week, overriding trader and investor concerns about transportation curbs in some countries as COVID-19 cases surge. In early trade, Brent crude was up 42 cents at $75.16 a barrel after edging higher on Tuesday. U.S. crude was up 53 cents at $73.51 a barrel, having risen 0.1% in the previous session. While the highly contagious Delta variant of the coronavirus is taking hold in many countries, prompting new lockdowns and movement restrictions from Australia to Portugal, hopes of a broader recovery in demand for fuel remain intact. In the meantime, OPEC Plus is scheduled to meet tomorrow, July 1. The meeting will decide on the group's production policy as it moves to release some of the barrels it has been withholding from the market to support prices after the evaporation of demand in 2020. To weigh into the outlook of the oil market ahead of the OPEC Plus meeting is the chairman and CEO, International Energy Services, Dr. Jiro Fawibe. Dr. Fawibe, thank you very much for joining us on the program this afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you, Shimeze. So, on one hand, there is the highly contagious Delta variant of the coronavirus taking hold in many countries, prompting new lockdowns. On the other hand, OPEC Plus decision is on the radar. Which of these for you will determine the future of the global oil market? Well, you see, the, the uh, meeting tomorrow, uh, we can easily predict what is likely to happen. Uh, we have uh, outstanding issues, which is that of... Uh, stabilizing the oil market and rebalancing the uh, supply and demand in uh, response to the changes in the uh, oil market. Now, the, the, uh, the last meetings of OPEC talked about increased production and as member countries were itching to have additional barriers you know, to sell. Nigeria, for example, is not, uh, it's not an exception in the sense that we need every barrel uh, uh, over and above what we are currently producing in order to be able to have revenue to meet some of the challenges we are having. So also some other countries like Russia, for example, and uh, but for the, uh, for the, the nuclear talk with uh, Iran, one would expect you know, Iran to uh, push for additional increase in production. Uh, but that may not happen, you know, especially at this time. But what in effect I'm saying now is that the uh, meeting of tomorrow we consider exhaustively the issue of uh, increase in production. And the Economic Commission Board, which is the expert uh, committee of, the, uh, of, the, of, the, of OPEC, and uh, usually meets before the, uh, any OPEC meeting uh, or OPEC conference. And now the, uh, um, uh, the monitoring committee has also met so all, everything will be done to ensure that the ministers have you know, very robust uh, discussion as regards you know, whether there should be increase in production. Uh, happily, the price of oil is going up, and that is what may uh, push member countries to want to uh, uh, increase uh, oil production. But like uh, many analysts have said, and even including Saudi Arabia, that we should tread cautiously because of the uh, current state of uh, uh, COVID, you know, especially with the Delta variant that is now restricting uh, movement in some uh, countries in Europe and uh, even in Asia. So for that reason, the demand that is being expected that may lead to increased production, you know, may not actually uh, be there. Uh, the OPEC, if you, if you remember, uh, cut by about 9.7 million barrels per day of oil. Uh, some of these uh, uh, volumes have been recovered you know, over the, uh, uh, this year. And uh, one expects that you know, there will be additional increase in production to the tune of about a half a million barrels to one million barrels. You know, uh, but uh, uh, member countries will discuss this. But uh, be that as it may, it may be a wise uh, thing to actually maintain the current production. Uh, uh, for example, for the month of July, the decision has been already been taken that the current production will remain intact. It's, we are now talking about uh, production from the month of August. If ever there's going to be any increase, it will be very marginal. Maybe we could be looking at about uh, 200,000 barrels per day or at most 500,000 barrels per day. But if member countries want to stress cautiously, uh, the, uh, uh, the decision will be 
to maintain the current level of, uh, uh, of production, at least at the uh, end of August. Maybe if the uh, Delta variant, you know, that is the, uh, which is now the major constraint that is uh, uh, making movement in Europe and America or Asia, you know, to be somewhat of a problem. And then if another OPEC meeting is scheduled for maybe end of August, uh, there could be, or end of July, there could be a decision to increase production at that time. Okay, Dr. Fawibe, we, we've seen oil price trade above $70. Some market analysts are calling for $100. Where do you see oil prices before the end of this year? And uh, what would that mean for Nigeria? Well, the, uh, the, uh, uh, many, country, uh, many analysts see the, uh, the price of oil going up to $100 per barrel. It's uh, neither here nor there. You know, uh, for example, uh, some countries are already talking about uh, the price of oil getting too high, especially post-COVID, because the economies of uh, industrialized countries are very fragile at this time. And many of them might not be able to absorb, you know, the price of oil being $100 per barrel. So to that extent, member countries, we also, open countries, we also consider that uh, it will not be in the interest of OPEC to allow the uh, price of oil to run away. Don't forget that the uh, US you know, uh, shale gas is waiting in the wind. If the price goes up to a certain level, it will then be seriously competing with uh, OPEC oil. And that is what many countries have been fighting against over time. And you can bet it that if the uh, uh, demand rises to the point that can push the price of oil to $100 per barrel, you can bet that uh, Russia we push for increase in production, and that will stem the, the, the tide of price, you know, at up to $100 per barrel. But I, I, I feel that the price of oil, if it is about $74 per barrel at this time, maybe if uh, uh, no control is exercised, the price could actually go to $100 per barrel. But I feel that the increase in production may actually reduce the price to a reasonable level uh, certainly below $100 per barrel. But that will also depend on the level of demand. You know, uh, uh, if the, the, there is no uh, uh, another variant of uh, COVID that comes up that will restrict uh, a movement of people, then you can see that the price of oil will be maybe hovering around uh, $80, $90 per barrel, but certainly not, uh, uh, not Hundred dollars per barrel because it's not in the interest of OPEC that the price runs away to the point that uh, uh, not uh, uh, shale gas will then be competing and then member countries will now be scampering for production cutback, you know, which may be a very uh, difficult uh, decision to take at that point in time. Very much, uh, uh, Dr. Fawibe, for sharing your thoughts with us on the program this afternoon. You're welcome. Thank you very much. And Ghana is heading for a record cocoa harvest after favorable weather and government interventions boosted output in the number two producer. The Ghana Cocoa Board has revised its production target to 1.1 million tons for the season that ends in September, asking not to be named as the information isn't public that compares with the board's initial goal for 900,000 tons and would exceed the nation's previous record crops of 1,000 1.025 million tons a decade ago. Ghana and neighboring Ivory Coast, which produce almost 70% of the world's cocoa, expanded output just as the pandemic locked down cities around the world, hurting demand. The record harvest could widen a global surplus of the chocolate-making ingredient. Ghana's Cocoa Board is implementing measures including hand pollination to improve productivity. Cocoa purchases graded and sealed by the industry regulator reached 981,222 tons as of June 17. An industrial and commercial bank of China, that's China's biggest bank, has dumped plans to fund a $3 billion coal-fired coal power plant in Zimbabwe in a blow to a two-decade effort to develop the project. 
Industrial and Commercial Bank of China says it wouldn't fund the 2,800 megawatts Sengowa coal project that Rio Energy Limited, a unit of Rio Zim Limited, is seeking to develop in northern Zimbabwe. A withdrawal would be a second setback to the bank's coal funding plans after a permit to build a coal-fired plant in Lamu in Kenya was cancelled by the government last year. The decision further narrows the funding options available to developers of coal projects in Africa as Western and South African banks have come under increasing pressure from their shareholders not to fund developments that could contribute to climate change. And that's it on the program. Thank you for watching. I'm Chimezi Ubi Iwago.